And I said, God, I can't do this anymore. And he carried me. We serve a God today that will carry us through every difficult season in our life. I realized this morning that we are now a week removed from Easter. Easter was last Sunday, of course. But I want to share my heart with you this morning and tell you all that I am not ready to move past Easter. Something is burning in my heart about the significance of sacrifice. Amen. And I've just got to share that with you today. Yes. At the end of this message, end of the service, we're going to be taking communion. And my heart cried out this morning that all of us would grasp and understand that from this day forward, that communion will never be looked at the same way again. That we will grasp the significance once again of what was done for you and for me Amen. on a cross at Calvary. Oh, yes. The significance of sacrifice in the Old Testament. The significance of sacrifice in the New Testament. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of God's will. The fulfillment of God's plan for mankind. For all of humanity, for all time, Jesus was the fulfillment of God's plan. Can I have that, please? Praise the Lord. I'm fighting a dry throat in Sunday school. And I guess I brought it with me into the sanctuary. But our message this morning is from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to begin reading verse number 1. We're going to read... The first 10 verses of this chapter, if you're able to stand, I want you to follow along with me. I'm reading, I believe, out of the New King James because it, King James is a, is a little more difficult maybe to, to, to read. But It says in verse 1, For the law, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come, good things are coming, and not the very image of the things, can never with those same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins Every year. Yes. Verse 4 said it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And therefore he said, he being the Lord Jesus, therefore he said when he came into this world, he said, sacrifice and offering. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. A body, he said. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. In the volume of the book it is written that I've come to do your will. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law, according to the Old Testament law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And Amen. you can be seated. Amen. In these ten verses. <laughs> we get a short descriptor here. That tells us. That the law. And the system of animal sacrifice. Could never perfect those. Who would come to God. They could never make them perfect. Those who wanted to come to God. Offering sacrifices could not do it. Coming to the temple faithfully one time a year and offering their sacrifices only meant that I've got to do it all over again next year. 
Verse number one said that the law was a shadow of good things to come. It was a shadow of Jesus. As a matter of fact, your Bible tells us that the law was a schoolmaster. It was a teacher to bring us to Christ. That's not to say that there was anything wrong with the law. The law, of course, was very purposeful. God set it in, in order. They served a purpose. It's the law and the commandments. And I'm going to get into that in detail in just a few minutes. The downside, however, was that all of the commandments were insufficient to do what had to be done. And that was take away sin for all time. Amen. They could not do it. Verse 2, he said, for if they could have done that, then would they not have ceased to be offered? In other words, if the animal's sacrifice could have taken away our sins, wouldn't they have ceased to be offered because our sins are gone? And what he's telling us here is simply this. The fact of the matter is that the repetition, the frequency of the sacrifices revealed its weakness and its inability to redeem mankind that was lost. You see, if animal sacrifices could have fixed the sin problem, they would have ceased to be offered. If all of those animals that were sacrificed could have fixed the problem of sin that was in the heart of man, they would have ceased to be offered. And we know that was impossible because verse 1 told us that those sacrifices had to be made again year after year. So we understand, don't we, that they could not take away the sin. Those animal sacrifices could not fix the problem of sin in the heart of man. Because in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Every repeated sacrifice reminded them of their sin. Think about what I just said. It brought the consciousness of sin to their mind and their heart every year. They couldn't get away from it. Every trip to the temple was a reminder of sin. Another goat, another bull, another dove, and on and on it went. Just when you thought, I finally got this dealt with, the year rolled around, and now it's back to the temple. Another sacrifice. There's no escaping my sin. It's facing me again today. I thought I was rid of this. But no, I'm not. Here it is again. Aren't you happy that the finished work of Jesus on the cross takes away our sin? Amen. Mm. Beloved, understand. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Well, why did they do that? They covered sin. It was a covering. It was a yearly covering for sin. They could not make the atonement or pay the price for the sin of man. They were not, they were not the sacrifice that God was going to require. Do you know the Hebrew word for atonement is kofar? which simply means to cover. It means to cover, not to take away sin. There was nothing that they offered that could take away sin. Left, it left them guilty. Every day they walked around knowing that the sin was still there. Never free from guilt. How many of you can remember before you came to the Lord Jesus that you walked around in guilt and sin? Amen? Do you remember those days? We don't look back with fondness, but we remember the, what that feeling felt like, don't we? Oh, yeah. Never being free from it. Always feeling that sin, that, that guilt, that condemnation, that knowing that I am not pleasing God. You see, the complete removal of sin required a sacrifice far greater than any animal. Any animal. Only Jesus. The perfect sacrifice of the new covenant, as we're going to see, could take away the sin of man. That's why the writer of Hebrews quoted Psalms 40 and verse 6 when he said, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Amen. Not required. All of these offerings, God is saying, they aren't doing what has to be done. More and more animal sacrifices, the psalmist said. No matter how many more, we'll never 
ever please God. They can't do it. How many millions, I don't know, tens of millions, we don't know, but how many millions of animals do you suppose were sacrificed just as a temporary covering for sin? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Somebody will ask, well, why in the world? If they couldn't erase the sin, what's the purpose? The purpose is, number one, they taught Israel. They taught Israel that sin separated them from God. That's the first thing. The second thing, it provided a way for the children of Israel to come to God through obedience and faith. And the third and last thing was the sacrificial system was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It pointed us in the direction of Calvary. Yeah. It pointed to the day and the time and the future when a Messiah was going to come and abolish the first system of sacrifice and implement a one-time sacrifice for all of us. It pointed the direction. In burnt offerings and sacrifices, he said, you had no pleasure no pleasure. Knowing this, what would bring God pleasure would only come through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We just celebrated Easter. We just celebrated Good Friday. Jesus was led away to be crucified. The sacrifice of God, the one that had been put, called upon to lay down His life, just a week ago, the whole world, the whole Christian world, that's all they were focused on was the sacrifice of the perfect Son of God. Beloved, to fix the sin problem of the world. To fix the sin problem required a sacrifice far greater than tens or hundreds of millions of animal sacrifices. The blood of bulls and goats, as, as important as that was to provide that temporal covering, was never going to be good enough. What God required was not necessarily a sin sacrifice, but a son sacrifice. He needed a son who would be willing to lay down his life and pay the price for our sin one time, once and for all, never again have to do it again. He said, Behold, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I have come to do thy will, O God. Every page, open your Bible this morning in the book of Genesis, the very first chapter, the first verse to the last chapter in the 22nd chapter of Revelation. In the volume of the book you will find as you read and study the Word of God that it all points to Calvary. It all points to the day when a sacrifice was going to be offered. It all points to the day when God's perfect plan was going to be fulfilled in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The submission of Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment that God had required. And Jesus going and being obedient to the cross was fulfilling the plan of God. Listen to what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And then he says this, Father, if I'll be willing, if you are willing, Lord, Father, remove this cup from me. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Amen. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I have come to do thy will, O God. In the garden as he prayed, his sweat, his sweat became as great drops of blood according to the scripture. So fervently did he pray. So fervently was he praying and calling out to God that we know that angels had to come and, and minister to him and help him to get through this terrible ordeal that he was about to go through. All of these things were part and parcel of him saying, I have come to do thy will, O God. The flesh says, oh God, if it's possible, is there any other way? The flesh, the man, Jesus the man cried out as any person would, knowing what lay ahead. God, is there any other way? Is there any other way? Nevertheless, I resign myself to do your will, not mine. Why? Because it's written in the volume of the book, it's written, I've come to do thy will, oh God. 
Jesus was on a path to Calvary. Why? Because it was God's will to slay his only son. Why did God do that? For you. He did it for you. And he did it for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. God, Heavenly Father, I come to do your will, not, with, not mine. Stay with me. We're about to jump off the deep end of the pool. I want to share something with you. Long before there was a Gethsemane, long before there was a Pilate's Hall, long before there was a crown of thorns, long, long, long before any of that, the sacrifice of Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Peter said this in Peter 1 and 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. John the Revelator was on the Isle of Patmos. And then his visions, on the, and we read in the book of Revelation, John saw many visions of Jesus. One day when John was there praying and he saw a vision of, a, of, of the Antichrist rising up out of the sea. But he identified Jesus this way. Talking about who's going to worship him, the Antichrist, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's Jesus. He was slain. He was destined to die. He was destined to pay the price for your sin. It was inescapable. It didn't matter if he had an other plan of his own. It didn't matter. He came to do God's will. And God's will from the before the foundation of the world, before God ever spoke earth and heaven and stars and sun and moon into existence, there was a plan already in place that one named Jesus was going to come one day and lay down his life. Why? Because God knew all along, honey, listen to this preacher this morning, when God put man in the Garden of Eden, God was not surprised when the devil showed up and tempted man and caused the fall in the Garden. None of that took God by a surprise. God had already had a plan for that or a countermeasure for that. He had already foreordained that no matter what takes place, I'm sending my son. Yes, the devil just destroyed the covenant that God had wanted with man. <coughs> but God is saying, before the foundation of the world, I got the fix for sin. I've got the fix for sin and no devil is going to derail the plan of God. There's no power that the enemy could ever mount up that was going to sidetrack the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he came to do the will of God and the will of God was to suffer for you and for me. Praise God. <coughs> Glory to God. What kind of God, what kind of God would do such a thing? What kind of God would do such a thing? A God of love, a God of mercy, a God of everlasting kindness, a God who cares more about you than you could ever hope to imagine. Amen. Amen. A God that knows the very thoughts and intents of your heart. A God that knows when you're up. And a God that knows when you're down. A God that knows when your marriage is falling apart. And a God that knows when the cupboards are bare. A God that knows you're coming and going. A God that knows every beat of your heart. And has numbered the very hairs on the top of your head. That's the God that said I love you. And I'm going to give the very best that I can give. Why? So that you can live with me for eternity. Amen. Amen. He said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He took away the first that he might establish the second. He took away the first. What he meant there was he took away the system of sacrifice and offering that he might take the, establish the second. Why did he take them away? Because it was proven they could not take away sin. They could not remove sin. 
that he may establish the second, that is, to do the will of God. Jesus came to do what no animal could ever do. Amen. If there had ever been an animal pure enough, holy enough, righteous enough, perfect enough, I believe God would have used that animal instead, but there wasn't. No. There wasn't. The Lamb of God. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. That is, by his obedience to the cross. Because of his faithful obedience, we today stand sanctified. We are set apart. We are called out. We are separated from the sin that's in this world. Through the offering of the body of Jesus... Offering his body in the place of all of those animals that could never redeem mankind. Doing the will of God by offering himself as a sacrifice of sin. As the means for our sanctification. As the means for us to become holy. As a means for us to become presentable to God. Beloved, he's coming back for a church without spot or blemish. Do you know that? Do you believe that this morning? He's coming back for a people who have been redeemed. A people, the blood-bought people of God. The people that are redeemed. Our Redeemer became obedient unto death. The death of the cross. And was willing to endure all manner of shame. Why? To do thy will, O God. To do thy will. Your sanctification. You're being set apart for God. It's, it rests on the foundation of the body of Jesus Christ that was given for you. Think about that. Once and for all, the ultimate sacrifice. Once and for all means never again. Sister Linda, never again. Never again. Shanna, never again. My Jesus... He laid on that cross once for all time. Once for all time. Do you see the contrast here? The contrast between the offering that Jesus made and the offerings made under the Old Testament law. Do you see the, con the, the contrast? The sacrifices under the law had to be renewed year after year. From the time you were old enough to have knowledge of, of sin to the day that you died, you had to continually go back and do that. But the atonement made by Jesus Christ was made once for all and would never again be repeated. Amen. 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 The ultimate sacrifice, Jesus. The fulfillment of God's redemptive plan, Jesus. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus. The Lamb of God that John the Baptist said that taketh away the sins of the world, Jesus. We remember Him. We worship Him. And we honor Him by the simple act of taking communion. My prayer, as I said at the beginning of this message, and I know this has been a different kind of a message, and I wanted it to be different. And I thank God that it has been. The things that are in my heart are not necessarily shouting things this morning. Because my heart is heavy. It's full of heaviness. Because I want us to fully understand as deeply as humanly possible that you were bought with a price. Amen. That you didn't just come this way. You didn't just happen by this way. But you came the blood-bought way. You came the way of the cross. As I said, I don't want us to ever look at communion the same way again. Beloved, hear me. From this day forward, my prayer is that when you hold that, that bread and that cup, that you'll think back to the fact that Jesus willingly gave his body in exchange for your sin. When you hold that cup and that bread, I hope your mind travels back in time 2,000 years to the place where they tied him to a whipping post and beat him to within an inch of his life. I hope that's what that means to you. I hope you, your mind is transformed back to Jesus on the cross 
with his blood pouring down, staining that old wood a deep, dark crimson. That's what I hope you take and you think about. May your mind journey back to the cross when we take communion. The bread and the cup of communion represent the fulfillment of all that God intended to do and all that God will ever do for mankind so far as redeeming his lost soul. Beloved, this bread and this cup, it represents the greatest love story ever told. It supersedes any love story that Hollywood could ever devise. There is no Romeo and Juliet, no love story, no poem, no, no sonata, no anything that comes close to the depth of God's love in that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, and we understand that. But this morning, the bread and the cup declare mission accomplished. The bread and the cup declare I have come to do thy will, O God, in the volume of the book it is written to me. And the whole world acknowledges mission accomplished. He did what he set out to do. He did what he set out to do. Can we just give the Lord a praise? Heavenly Father, we worship you on this solemn day. Father, we understand that millions of sacrifices were made for the sin of people, but they were never taken away. It took the blood of Jesus. It took God's only Son coming and saying, in the volume of the book, it's written to me, I've come, O oh God, to do thy will. That's what it took to purchase my freedom. That's what it took to take the guilt and condemnation of sin away from me. That's what it took to purchase my freedom for all time. That's what it took, O oh God. God, we thank you for the way of the cross. We thank you, O oh God, for the blessed Son named Jesus. <coughs> Lord, our hearts this morning, we give you honor this morning, O oh God. We praise you, O oh God. Lord, I ask you to touch every heart. Every heart that's here, every heart of those watching online or on, on, on YouTube or wherever they may see this video. Lord God, I pray that you'll speak into their heart and help them to understand, God, that we didn't just stumble our way in here. God, we didn't just happen to get lucky enough to be called a Christian. But God, we're here because there is a blood-stained banner that was wrought by the precious Son of the Most High God that made a way where there seemed to be no way. And He bought my freedom. He bought and paid for me. Oh God, I owed a debt I could not pay. But the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, paid a debt He did not owe. All for us. Because He fulfilled God's plan. Hallelujah. We serve a mighty God today. We serve an awesome God who loves us. If you're here this morning and you are, you're not yet a child of God. I've just laid out for you the price that was paid for your salvation. I've just laid it out for you as plain as I can without going way overboard, but I've laid it out as plain as I can. I've explained to you that you needed a Savior because what was wasn't good enough to redeem you, but what you needed, God provided in His Son. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, this is your time. God has brought you here for such a time as this. To hear this message, to hear this word, to allow God to prick your heart and to reveal unto you His Son loves you. To reveal unto you that you were bought with a price. How long, how long will we reject the gift of God? Glory to God. 
Is there anyone here that needs to pray? If you need Jesus, don't let this, this moment in time pass you by. Hallelujah.